Good afternoon and good evening and welcome to our the Gulf International Forum's virtual event, uh, the first uh, one of the first of the year, an invitation to a conversation with His Excellency Dr. Abu Bakr al-Kirbi, uh, the former and longest serving Prime Minister, uh, Foreign Minister of Yemen. Yemen uh, was at this time last year, or all through the last few years, the most the damaging, the most dangerous, uh, the most horrible humanitarian crisis uh, in the, in virtually the entire world. Now, uh, the rest of the Gulf seems to be looking for different ways of, how can I say, arranging matters between them, of de-escalating, while the war in Yemen has heated up. Uh, forces led by the UAE uh, as part of the Saudi-led uh, uh, coalition uh, have blunted the Houthi victories around Shabu and Marib. They've introduced new factors into the equation. The Houthis responded by uh, starting missile attacks directly against the UAE uh, in retaliation for these uh, setbacks. And the, uh, the coalition struck uh, Yemen and are stuck major cities in Yemen with a tremendous loss of life. Uh, uh, ordinary Yemenis are paying the greatest price. Yemen now faces unprecedented levels of poverty and possibly large-scale starvation. Until the sudden escalation, we all thought that we'd seen the first glimmers of peace. Baghdad had hosted the first round of talks between Saudi Arabia and Iran, aiming to de-escalate the tension between the Gulf's two pillars. Uh, these talks continue, and we all thought that uh, Iran would be in a position to bring the Houthis along to a some sort of negotiated settlement. Uh, things are not going well at the moment. Uh, the uh, so I, we have the honor of, of meeting today. Do His Excellency Dr. Abu Bakr al Kirbi, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, I said, of the Republic of Yemen. He is the longest serving uh, Foreign Minister of Yemen. Uh, prior to that. I think he was happier as the dean of the medical school of Sana University in 1993, when he, uh, until 1993, when he was appointed Minister of Education. He has a background in medicine and has received degrees from universities, uh, various universities in Scotland and England. So, Dr. Kirby, uh, uh, Dr. Kirby, it is uh, a great honor to have you here, and as I say once again, uh, the Arab war, or Yemen is lucky in to have had people of your caliber leading, uh, leading the governments in the past. If I could start the conversation by asking sort of a general question. Uh, Yemen has suffered. It has suffered like no other country has. Uh, some of that suffering has now been overshadowed by uh, events in other parts of the world. Uh, and the country seems to be no closer to any resolution. What is the effect of the current events and the sort of dim view of the future on the Yemeni people? Dr. Kirby, Dr. Kirby. Well, first of all, uh, let me say a good day for everybody, uh, because I'm sure we have different uh, times, differences between our regions. Uh, let me thank you for inviting me to this session, and I hope it will contribute to a uh, a little more understanding to the situation in Yemen, the ca catastrophic situation in Yemen, uh, as you have indicated. I think uh, what you hear about the suffering of Yemenis is minimal compared to what the, the reality, reality portrays. Uh, the latest figure of the those who've been uh, killed or died during the conflict is over 360,000. I think this is an underestimate because I'm sure there are many more killed by poverty, by lack of medical care, by lack of uh, uh, normal residential areas for them to live in, and therefore the, the suffering is enormous. This is complicated even more by using the economy really as a means of uh, a war in itself because of the sanctions, because of the uh, transfer of funds, because of the inability of business to, uh, to take 
the normal course of events under these situations. Uh, so there is an economic uh, starvation of, by the Yemenis, actually. Uh, this was a policy which was initiated after the Kuwait negotiations in the hope that it will limit the Ansar Allah's abilities to continue. But it, it proved uh, uh, and resulted in uh, rather the opposite of what was planned for. Uh, the not lives of uh, millions of children in Yemen had been also this, the, uh, hurt by the, the conflict. Schools, uh, generations now are really out of schools, and this will continue and will have a, an impact on the future of Yemen even after the post-conflict resolution. Uh, this, there is also the problem of the health care system, which is now uh, suffering a great deal as a result of, of this war. So it is a very compounded uh, 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 catastrophe. Uh, I'm sure if you have read the briefings of the humanitarian sent to the Secretary General on the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, you will you will, you can easily see how the extent of the uh, destruction, the extent of the poverty, the extent of ill health, uh, poor education, and so on as a result of this war. And this is unfortunately, I think, the result of the poor management of the uh, uh, the international community of the war and, and, and putting an end to the war. And also of the regional powers who are uh, having a proxy war in Yemen. Uh, thank you. This, which then brings us to, uh, to today. Uh, Clearly, uh, the course of the fighting has changed, but it still is largely a stalemate. Uh, the UAE-led uh, uh, forces, the, giant, the so-called Giants Brigade, have apparently stopped the Houthi push on Madrid, uh, but are no closer to pushing the Houthis back into the, uh, into the mountains, into northwestern Yemen, than they were uh, a year ago. Uh, it was... Uh, but events, but the war has escalated. There's been really horrific uh, raids on Yemeni cities. The Houthis have carried the war into Abu Dhabi, into the UAE. Uh, do you see any incentive at the moment for the parties to try and negotiate their way out of an expanded war, or does the uh, does the expanded war just make things more complicated and more difficult? Well, certainly, I think it makes it much more difficult, and I think. Uh what are the possibilities of uh, and the results of this escalation? Uh, uh, there are probably two possibilities. One is uh, for one side to win the, uh, and defeat the other, uh, which I'm, I think you will agree, and many uh, uh, military experts will say that after six years of war, in which there was a stalemate and inability to uh, conclusively uh, win a victory in this conflict, uh, that it's unlikely that there will be a, a, a defeat of one or the other of the uh, fighting parties. So, uh, and, and this, therefore, uh, uh, if it continues like this, it will have to stop in the end of the day because of the financial and the humanitarian cost uh, to, the, to, to the war. And therefore, they will eventually come back to the negotiating table. The other possibility, of course, is to as some uh, portray in a lot of articles written that this is probably this escalation is probably trying to force Ansar Allah to, to show flexibility and increase uh, uh, decrease their belligerence and and come to the negotiating table. Uh, the, the risk here is, is that if the, they achieve this objective, will they maintain uh, this attitude? Or will they raise the uh, level of their demands to Ansar Allah uh, and to, to submit completely, which will obviously would not be achieved? So here is a, is a problem really between two of these possibilities. But I think, in, in spite of that, I think what's important with this escalation now is that in the, I'm sure that as, as the escalation goes on, uh, the parties would, would, would like to see a way out of it. And where, who is going to get the two parties a way out of, of the conflict and the escalation? Hopefully, the uh, 
special and special envoy will take this opportunity and come with innovative ways of uh, involving uh, the two parties in uh, behind scenes uh, negotiations to uh, to uh, to achieve a ceasefire and possibly in the end uh, get the Yemenis to the uh, negotiating table for a comprehensive solution of the conflict. Uh, that's a very, this question of perhaps a behind-the-scenes secret negotiation in order to start an open negotiation is very interesting. I was recently on a television program involving the spokesman for Ansar Allah, and he made a comment that I, I must admit I had to go back and do some research, which was the conditions being set by the Saudis and the coalition uh, for a uh, for a ceasefire or for negotiations, excuse me, the conditions being set uh, by the Saudi government uh, for negotiations uh, amount to a an, a surrender in advance by uh, Ansar Allah, by the Houthis. Uh, could you uh, sort of enlighten our audience as a little bit on the background uh, of that statement? Well, I think, uh, as you probably remember, the uh, Saudi initiative was basically uh, uh, based on something that happened long before that, and that is the Kerry initiative. So there is a, a, an element of Kerry's initiative in the Saudi uh, initiative, as well as the plan that Mr. Martin Griffiths also developed for uh, the uh, initiation of uh, the process of negotiations. Uh, what I think what, uh, was not clear in, uh, in, this, in the Saudi initiative for, uh, for a ceasefire is that there was no an implementation plan or how it can be achieved. And therefore, it, it, it was an initiative that was uh, thrown at the Houthis without a complementary implementation plan for it. Uh, and the Houthis are, are, are always suspicious of anything that they cannot deal with. So their attitude is to refuse it. Ah, interesting. Uh, among the foreign mediating powers, the UN, the United States, uh, whoever uh, else is trying to get uh, to play a role, uh, do you see all things remaining equal with no particular change in policy? If there is a mediator, if there is an outside power that indeed can <clears throat> make a difference, or do we need to change, uh, do the outside powers who are involved need to change their tactics and do something different? Well, I think, uh, let me first of all hope that uh, the five permanent members uh, of, of the Security Council who are until now appear to have uh, a united position on the resolution of the conflict in Yemen will continue along that line because it's important to facilitate the process. Because if uh, Yemen's uh, crisis and war is engulfed also by the other crises and becomes secondary uh, uh, problem to them, or if it becomes part of the deals for settlement of other conflicts as well, then the situation will get worse in Yemen than better. So I think it is important that uh, the focus should be on a united five permanent member uh, uh, of the Security Council on, on, on the, in the case of Yemen. Second point, I think, which is important for the UN Security Council, uh, and, and this is, has been, I think, in, for me, the uh, long-term uh, complaint of the UN Security Council is that they have never really addressed the briefing by the special invoice uh, very critically to understand who are obstructing the process and what are the obstructing factors because they tend always to look at the obstructors as being the Yemenis only when there are ele obstructing elements within the coalition, within the region, and within the United Nations Security Council itself, because they, they did not address some of the uh, resolutions that have been, uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, making life difficult for the special envoys to progress on in, in, in his attempts to mediate. 
Ah, an inter that's an interesting thought. Do you believe that there are, in fact, among the outside actors or outside players uh, in Yemen, uh, some who actually uh, see benefit uh, from a continuation of the war? Uh, well, they would like uh, to use the war to achieve their own objectives, yes. Okay, but I think if, if, they, if the deal is made in which everybody's interests are safeguarded, then I think the interests of the war will diminish. Uh, how much real authority do the outsiders have over the people they are supporting in Yemen? Could they turn them off? Could, uh, do they actually have the uh, capacity to force their side to go to, say, peace negotiations if the people they are supporting don't want to do it? I think if you talk to uh, as many Yemenis I, uh, as you want, you, everybody will say that to you that the Yemenis themselves have no longer any control of the outcome of the conflict or in the decision making about how things should be resolved. So, uh, so these, uh, the events now are not in the uh, control of the events is not in the hands of the Yemenis. And this is why the Yemenis have to be empowered again by the UN Security Council as many of its resolutions state that the solution should be Yemeni Yemeni. And therefore how do we uh, how, how do we make it Yemeni Yemeni? It, it can be only made Yemeni Yemeni if the, uh, uh, those who pro uh, are involved in the proxy war, those who are involved also in, uh, in, in, in the benefits of the uh, war uh, are, are removed from being involved or affecting the process of negotiations between the Yemenis. Interesting you should say that. Uh, I am old enough to remember the other civil war in Yemen. My first assignment in the American Foreign Service was to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia in 1963, when the uh, Yemen civil war supported by Saudi Arabia on one side and Egypt on the other side was in full swing. And what I remember is that with the withdrawal of the Egyptians, the side that the Egyptians were supporting actually won. And the side that the Saudis who, uh, uh, the, the, that of the kingdom, was the side that lost. I mean, do you see some sort of different uh, dynamic coming to play if the, uh, if the outside powers withdrew their support for their proxies? Well, I, I think uh, maybe you have to get the proxies first to, to re uh, resolve their differences. But can they resolve their differences without the outside powers forcing them to do well, so? I, I think, well, this is where I think uh, uh, we were hoping that the United States of America, after uh, Mr. Biden's promises during his election campaign about Yemen, that he will uh, develop a strategy which will ensure that the United States understands that the war is not purely Yemeni, Yemeni, but it has also those outsiders who are involved in this war for various reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and, and therefore, if you cannot separate between the two, the conflict will continue. Yes. And therefore, I mean, either, either you have to get the Yemenis, Yemenis to uh, uh, sit around the uh, negotiating table, or you get the proxies sit around the negotiating table first before the Yemenis sit, or get them all around the same table and, and let them negotiate uh, and it becomes clear really who is behind who. Do you believe that if, uh, say, the conversations going on between Saudi Arabia and Iran in Baghdad uh, lead to bigger understandings between the two countries that they want to defuse some of the tensions between them, uh, do you believe that this would be reflected in Yemen? I believe, it, I, I believe it will help, yes, for sure. I think any diffusion of any differences between regional powers in, in, in the Middle East will help in resolving conflicts because it will lead to confidence building, will lead to understanding the red lines for each of the sides, and therefore will provide uh, the, the tools even for the mediators for a solution in Yemen to build on. 
uh, which then, so what would the outside powers accept in your view as the minimum requirements for, uh, what's what I'm looking for, uh, for uh, bringing things to a, a, to a head? I think that, uh, whatever solution they think of, first of all, must be acceptable to the Yemeni people. Yes, but what's acceptable to the outside powers? Presumably, they are in this for their own so selfish reasons. The, uh, the, uh, because some of the... Uh, uh, what's acceptable to outside powers may not be acceptable to the Yemenis. And therefore, it will not provide the answer to the problem we are, ha we are facing. And therefore, we have, you have to combine both the interests of the Yemenis and the Yemen with the interests of the neighbors and, 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 and the international community as well. Yeah. Well, we have some questions from the outside from Dr. Danya. Uh, after the attack on the uh, United Arab Emirates, some U.S. senators called uh, to designate the Houthis as a terrorist group. Now, it appears quite unlikely that this will happen, uh, but what would be the consequences of uh, the decision if President Biden made such uh, consequences if President Biden made a decision to uh, declare them a terrorist group again as President Trump had done? Well, I think uh, uh, Mr. Trump made that decision and Mr. Biden came and aborted it. And, and the question now is for, for everybody to think about the uh, effect of putting the Ansar Allah on the terrorist list. Uh, I think what we have to under, make sure is whatever actions are taken do not harm the Yemeni people. Yeah. Yemeni people are, are now the subject of the, uh, the uh, sufferers of this war. And we should not take any steps that will add to their suffering. So you believe that uh, that putting the uh, Houthis on Saudi Allah on the terrorist list would would add to the suffering in the country? Well, well, this has been the argument always, I think, by the humanitarian organizations. Not not only not only in uh, in, in in Yemen, but in in, in uh, Iran, in uh, Iraq, during the war of Iraq, that all the putting people on the sanctions list and so on uh, actually are. Uh, detrimental to the uh, well-being of the country population. Okay. Uh, do you think uh, one character, one person who has been sort of absent from the discussion, uh, at least outside Yemen, where in Yemen or outside we talk about really three parties to the uh, conflict. We talk about the uh, Ansar Allah, we talk about the Saudi coalition, and we talk about uh, the Iranians. Uh, we rarely talk about the leadership of the internationally recognized government of Yemen, uh, Yemen which theoretically uh, should be in the lead in these. Uh, why has President uh, El Hadi uh, sort of been eclipsed by what has happened, and what can he or should he do uh, to play a greater role? Well, this is part of the, I think, the answer to the previous question is that he's, he's been disempowered really by the coalition. Uh, and, and, and therefore, his role as in decision making, in, in uh, directing the Yemen's governments to find solutions for the conflict, to come with initiative to resolve the conflict, uh, to uh, if you remember in 2011, when we were in a crisis, uh, we took the initiative of uh, developing the GCC initiative. So I think uh, President Hadi should take the responsibility now, and he should be supported and facilitated by the uh, coalition. Yeah. So, but he should be the face of the other side for the negotiations, at least in the, peer, in the person leading them. Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, so you believe that President El Hadi, uh, President Hadi should be the, the, the face of the side dealing with, uh, negotiating with Ansar Allah and not the Saudis and the UAE or the others? Well, this is what happened in, in, uh, in Kuwait uh, when we started uh, the negotiations in, 19, in 2016. 
and it was more successful at the time? I think it was more successful, yes. We were about to reach a uh, resolution of the conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, now that the fragment, that, that the sort of the fissure that developed in the Gulf Cooperation Council begins to look like it's being healed, uh, do you believe that there's an, a role or an opportunity for the uh, other countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council to play a role, say with Yemen, uh, say Oman, Qatar, and Kuwait? Do they have an opportunity to play a role? Or is it really simply up to the United Nations, in your view, of the Security Council? Well, I was hoping always that the GCC uh, countries will uh, take back their GCC initiative uh, implementation process and take responsibility to implement uh, and end the conflict in Yemen. Because uh, I'm sure that uh, they are more than the United Nations are more concerned about the Yemeni situ Yemen situation. They will, uh, the, any deterioration of the situation in Yemen will have its impact on the GCC countries, on the stability of the GCC countries. And therefore, I hope that they will understand that their role uh, in resolving the conflict is of utmost importance to themselves and to the Yemenis. Uh, if we do get negotiations started, with the negotiations, uh, does each side come with a specific idea of what they want? I mean, uh, does the Haida government want to reestablish a unitary government, say, for example, in which the Ansar Allah might participate? Do Ansar Allah look at their... Uh, uh, are they looking at being the government for the whole of Yemen? What uh, where do you think are the negotiating uh, positions, or at least the negotiating objectives of each side right now? As you probably remember, uh, the uh, uh, comprehensive national dialogue that has taken place in Yemen has uh, outlined a lot of uh, uh, solutions for the many areas for Yemen's future development, for the Yemen's future democracy, for the state, uh, uh, whether it's a, a parliamentary system or a presidential system, and all these issues. These are, have been, many of them have been approved and some are, have not been. And therefore, when we go to negotiations, we have something to build on. We are not starting from zero point. There are recommendations that we have to adhere to adhere to with what we have accepted by, by what has been accepted by all those who participated in the negotiations there are areas of differences like uh, is it a unitary government or not uh, is separation acceptable or not these are will have to be put on the table for the negotiations when when it is convened but what is important now is really to get the parties to and give them the freedom to put any issue they think is important for them as political parties or as militias or whatever they are because unfortunately now the players have uh, after seven years of the war have increased there are now players that has been created by the by the war itself by the coalition and and it's important now to say they will be excluded so the process for developing and uh, 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 comprehensive negotiating for the, all the issues is going to be difficult. And this is what will make the task of the special envoys and those who will sponsor the, uh, the uh, political solution for Yemen very difficult. It has to be uh, also, uh, they all have to find ways of how to get the parties into a, a a reasonable size to re for negotiation. Yeah. Are there particular measures, unilateral steps that may be taken by one side or another that would facilitate a move towards negotiation? I think ceasefire is very important. The removal of the uh, blockades, opening airports, facilitating people's movements in the country, the economic, the removal of the economic uh, now divisions between the north of the south, they will all help things and will uh, be very important factors for confidence building. 
you mentioned the economic divisions between the North and the South. Is there a real danger, uh, do you believe, that we could again see a split uh, between uh, the two halves of Yemen, uh, between the old, the old kingdom and uh, what was once the Aden Protectorate of the, uh, uh, for the British? Well, I think there is uh, there is a risk. Uh, one cannot deny that. Yes, but uh, I think uh, I think uh, if the United Nations Security Council and the uh, regional countries adhere to the UN, Secu uh, uh, UN Security Council resolutions, which always stress the protection of human sovereignty and unity, they have to abide by that resolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, along those same lines, continue the question. Uh, at some point last year, it became obvious that the that Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates seemed to have two. Uh, how can I say this? Two different visions for the future of Yemen post-war. Uh, how, how does that situation now stand, and where do you think uh, uh, is it going? Is there a rivalry between the two? Do they have different objectives? Or is this just a minor disagreement between them? Difficult to answer this question, but for sure, I think there had been differences between them. Uh, it appears now that they have resolved it, and this is why the Emirates have uh, uh, come back to uh, got involved in the uh, in the war in, in Shabwa. Uh, so, uh, is this now? Uh, return of nor normal relationship hopefully will, will, uh, will be built on a number of important elements uh, and the strategy in dealing with the end of the war of Yemen which will protect its sovereignty and, and uh, territorial integrity and uh, unity uh, then uh, I, we hope that this uh, return of normality will be a positive one does what appears to be an occupation of Socotra, which is not figured in the war so much, by the United Arab Emirates concern you, or if not, why not? Well, I think any action that touches on the sovereignty of Yemen is worrying to every Yemeni, not to me personally. No, but I, uh, my question is probably a little bit more difficult to answer. Uh, do you see this as a long-term threat to Yemeni uh, sovereignty or unity, or a, uh, is it something that you don't think will stay? No, I don't think it will stay. Yeah. It's interesting, because Socotra has not really been uh, part of the battlefield. Uh, is there any danger that this might... Uh, bring Socotra into the fighting in some way? Well, I hope not, I hope not. But uh, uh, there is a possibility if things do not uh, turn in, uh, in, in the eventual settlement of the conflict uh, to ensure that Socotra remains a, a, a Yemeni territory. And, and is, is the STC in the south, the uh, Southern Territorial uh, uh, Group, have they become a more important player? Are they part of the Hadi uh, government, or do they are they independent? Do you think? Well, they are now part of Hadi government, of course, after the Riyadh uh, signing of the Riyadh agreement between the STC and the Hadi government. Uh, but uh, many southerners uh, do not accept them to be the sole representatives of the southerners. Who else? Uh, who else does represent Southerners, in your opinion? Well, there is uh, GPC is an important uh, party to represent Southerners. Uh, Islah Party is another. Uh, uh, Socialist Party is another. There are Nasserites as well. So there are a lot of political parties in the South. Yes, the South always had a richer political life than the North in many ways. I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in the north, are there any elements uh, in the Houthi-controlled territories that might uh, break away from the Houthis or might uh, push them in another direction? 
when there are, of course, I mean, GPC is still a party in the north. There are also a Salah party in the north. All these parties that I mentioned in the south are present in the north as well. Uh, and, and they differ with Ansar Allah on issues and they agree on issues. Uh, just like in the south with the STC. Uh, and and the, I think uh, and and and, and uh, the land uh, the outline of the political uh, picture of of Yemen politically and political parties uh, we, unfortunately is now shrouded with uh, uh, uncertainty because of the of the war and inability of people to express their points of view. If you were the principal advisor to Mr. Linder King, what would you be telling him right now that what role the United States should play? Well, I think the United States, for, for, for the first thing they should do really is to address the uh, humanitarian issue in Yemen and to ensure that their policies, the United States policies, to ensure that the UN Security Council see a resolutions or actions or whatever recommendations they make uh, are uh, uh, are going to help and relieve the humanitarian issue in, in Yemen. The second, of course, is to how he, with the special envoy, UN special envoy, can delineate really what are the demands. What are the concerns? What are the guarantees that are uh, that the parties uh, in, in the conflict uh, would like? Because you cannot develop an uh, an initiative and a resolution of the conflict plan unless you know what our uh, opponents want, what they are, what there are fears, what there are concerns. And what are the guarantees they want that if there is an agreement, it will be implemented? The, the, the third, is, I think, is for the United Nations Security Council is to agree on a, a, a new approach, an innovative approach to the resolution of the conflict in Yemen, based on the principles that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and 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 the fourth point is to focus on the point also that I mentioned earlier, that they, they should embolden the Yemenis and f get them to, to the negotiating table, uh, table uh, to see how they would draw the map for an, uh, an exit plan from this conflict, for a roadmap to the future, and for building a new Yemen, hopefully. Speaking of the United Nations Security Council, and more specifically of the five permanent members, uh, and this is, nothing would appear to be different between the five permanent members. Not, uh, I can't imagine that any of them would like to see a continuation of the Yemeni war. Uh, they don't have any particular benefit from them. Uh, what has prevented them, in your view, from being much more, uh, being more forceful? Because, uh, you know, clearly, these are the five superpowers. Uh, these are the five countries that are capable of enforcing decisions if they get together in the United Nations Security Council, and yet they have been relatively passive in the last year or so. Uh, what do you think is keeping them from being more aggressive, more dynamic? Well, it's, uh, I think the answer to this uh, is in the policy makers and the foreign ministries of these five countries. Uh, I'm avoiding answering the question. Yes. But, okay. <laughs> I mean, I know that's Some questions are probably unfair, but uh, but, but uh, you know, I just don't see where China, Russia, Britain, France, or the United States have any interest in a perpetuation of the war. Uh, well, I, I think you, you see, uh, you must understand that in, in the end, there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, economic interest. Uh, between these five countries and the Gulf GCC countries, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates. And this has to be taken into consideration in taking any position on Yemen. So we're getting back to... Including, what... including of course, the United States of America yeah. uh, and, and Britain and, and France. 
who are more important players, you believe, than Russia and China on this issue? Yes. Yeah. So what you're saying is this brings us back to your original thesis that the real decisions have to be made in the capitals of the supporters of the of the different factions in Yemen rather than in Yemen themselves itself. Well, I think the process will should start there. Yes, if if one wants to cut a short uh, the road to the solution. Otherwise, without agreement there, we're just going to continue seeing this tragic war continue. I, I am afraid. And, and, yes, and 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 they, and they be part of the obstruction elements. So how do we, I mean, there is one faction in the United States, uh, one, uh, uh, one group in the United States that would like to see the United States uh, essentially cut off all military assistance to Saudi Arabia in such a way that the Saudis would find it very difficult to participate in the war. Uh, do you think this would be helpful? Well, I think what's important is, is it, is it feasible? I think, I don't think it is feasible that I mean, the U.S. will take that decision. Not feasible for political reasons, not practical reasons, what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Though the, that clearly was what President Biden uh, said when he first came to office. And it's clearly what um, many important and influential members of, uh, of Congress are saying. But you still don't think, in the end, that the United States would take such a decision? So that's, uh, that's okay. I thought it was my phone. Could you ask the question yes. again? Uh, I mean, in the United States, a year ago, when President Biden took office, uh, he made some very strong statements about preventing the Saudi, uh, but stopping all American military aid that would stop, that would prevent this, uh, allow the Saudis to continue uh, participating in military operations in Yemen. Uh, he has failed, he has partly followed up on that, but not very much. There is a strong sentiment, or at least a rhetorical sentiment in the Congress on both the, for both the Republican and uh, Democratic parties that they would like to see stronger action in cutting off the Saudi ability uh, to wage war. Uh, uh, but in the end, we haven't uh, gotten there yet. If they were to succeed, how would this affect? If they were, in fact, able to take the political decision uh, to cut off aid to Saudi Arabia, uh, how do you think the events would transpire in, in Yemen? I think that in itself will not resolve the conflict in Yemen. What what will resolve the conflict in Yemen is really to have a, a real strategic plan to end the war and to, to know who are the proxy players and the Yemeni players and deal with them to get them to negotiate a political settlement for the conflict. And who would draft that? I mean, what party? Would draft that plan. Would draft that assessment in that plan. Which is the most well, important uh, party? There, there has been in, in Kuwait. There has been already a draft for a plan which deals uh, with a number of these important issues. It has to be revised now. The United Nations Security uh, Special Envoy can, with his team, develop this, share it with the, the proxies. Uh, uh, modify it in, in ways that will make it acceptable to the warring parties, and then they have to go and negotiate. And they would negotiate on the basis of such a plan? Uh, of so, such a proposal, yes. It is yeah. a proposal. Yeah. Until yeah. proposal right. being yes. So bring the parties to the table uh, for negotiations without any prior conditions would probably not work in your view. Well, I think it's always been stated that people have to negotiate without any preconditions. Yeah, but even without a plan, even without a proposal. What if they, if you could bring them all to the table again, or has this been tried and failed? No, they can put all their conditions when they come to the table, but not before coming to the table. Not before coming to the table. Uh, the uh, recent airstrikes 
uh, that are cut off the uh, internet throughout Yemen, I understand, not just in the Houthi controlled areas. Uh, have uh, Did that have a major effect in the, uh, in the government controlled areas as well as uh, in the areas in the north? I don't have the details really of this aspect until now. Okay. Uh, there is a lot of reports, but uh, they haven't been authenticated. Mm -hmm. Uh, a few months ago, an Omani delegation visited Sana'a. Uh, uh, it appears to have left with empty hands. Why do you think it was the case? This is difficult for me to answer, but I, I uh, based on uh, what I heard from the Omanis, that uh, there has been progress uh, in, that, uh, in that visit, but it hasn't materialized into an, an action plan. So they are still working on, an, on a way to revive their efforts for a resolution of the conflict and mediation. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, uh, getting back to the north-south split, uh, where one uh, Neil Patrick asks, there was a talk in 2018 and 2019 of uh, an informal north-south split in Yemen. Uh, would that be a way of, be, uh, uh, how can I say, of starting a process of disengagement between the sides? Uh, would it be, uh, would it be something that would uh, uh, that would affect the UAE's uh, view of the war? I think the decision should be Yemeni without any interference from any other uh, outside partner. The unity yeah. of Yemen uh, is an Yemeni issue and should be decided by the Yemenis. And the uh, National Dialogue recommendations has dealt with this and proposed ways of dealing with, with, with the pro uh, causes of this split or desire to split between north from the south. And, and I think uh, uh, under existing conditions uh, of the of the war, discussing this issue inflames people and complicates the solution. I so, think should, so people should first return to normality, look at their constitution, deal with the issues according to the constitutions and to the recommendations of the uh, uh, national dialogue. Are there constitutional changes that might actually uh, uh, make a long-lasting peace uh, uh, better or more likely? Well, there is now a draft uh, new constitution which uh, that deals with all the recommendations that uh, are the outcome of the national dialogue. Mm -hmm. So there would be changes in the constitution that might be useful for the future. Yes. Uh, another uh, member of the audience asks, "Why did the Stockholm Agreement not succeed? Uh, how can we re, how can we rectify future mistakes? Uh, we talk about a deal or its implementation." Well, the Stockholm uh, Agreement, I think, had uh, three, from, from my point of view, three flaws. One is that uh, uh, the signing parties to it signed it tactically not, and not believing in it. So there was no real commitment to implement after it was signed. But there were pressure on them to sign, and therefore they signed. The second point is that signing it, there was no implementation plan, and therefore when everybody started to implement it according to their interpretation of the, uh, the, the plan. And third, that there are a number of components within the uh, Stockholm uh, Agreement involving Sana'a, involving the uh, revenues from Hadeda port, involving the central bank, involving ties that were not addressed. And therefore, the uh, unfortunately, the agreement as a whole was not imp implemented in full. Mm -hmm. And you say that was because none of the parties really believed in the agreement, they just signed it because they were pushed to do so. Yeah, they, they, they did not have really enough time to, to debate it. Oh, no. Okay. What are the questions? Uh, 
if uh, is there a not a time limit? That's the wrong term. Uh, but are there events out there that are pushing Yemen towards an even more dire difficulty that would require that if we don't do something first, it's a little bit like climate change. If we don't do something first, the damage that will uh, that will incur is so great that it won't be fixable. It can't be fixed. No, I am not that uh, pessimistic. I think whatever damage is done, Yemeni people have the. Uh, the courage and the power to survive and to rebuild. Uh, I think what they need is to resolve the, to end this war, to uh, have a, a roadmap to their future, and, and in the end they will fix everything, like many other countries that have gone to, through conflicts and survived. So uh, everything is fixable as long as the, uh, the right leadership is uh, comes to 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 take responsibility. So you are optimistic about the ability of the Yemeni people to fix things? Sure. If you were, uh, another question is clearly the, uh, the, one of the major actors in this is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, what do you think would motivate, what sort of things would motivate him to take some more dramatic action uh, to de-escalate the war? What, uh, what, what's in it for him to de-escalate? And why doesn't he de-escalate? Well, I think KSA and, and maybe other uh, countries in the region have concern of Yemen regarding their national security and presence of inf other influences in the country, in the, in the case of Yemen, influence of Iran. Uh, and I'm sure this is an issue that can be resolved easily by through negotiations, a political solution which would ensure that Yemen is not going to be a base for any foreign power or to create a, a threat to the security of any of its neighbors. How could those guarantees come to Saudi Arabia from the from Ansar Allah, for example? Well. Through the political, uh, the political solution, because the political solution will have to address the issues of Yemen's concerns and the GCC countries' concerns as well. So, those are the concerns of Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the security, the, the security of Saudi uh, of Saudi Arabia, and the guarantee that Yemen would not be a threat to that security. Uh, is there something that the Saudis could do now to telegraph? this to say in effect i'm all i'm making you an offer of something right now uh let's start the ball rolling as long as you understand that this is uh this is my bottom line is there something the saudis could do now that is feasible from the point of view of riyadh uh that might start the ball here i think uh, i think this is something that has to be done through mediation and, and not uh, publicly uh and so, in effect, we'd have to have the mediation going before the Saudis could make any gestures. Sure. And the same, in your view, would apply to Ansar Allah as well? Sure, it would apply to Ansar Allah as well. And the mediator with them would be... And, and the legitimate government as well. And the legitimate government. And the mediator with Ansar Allah would be Iran, in your view, or somebody else? Does any have influence with uh, the Houthis? Well, uh, they have uh, excellent relationships with Iran. They have excellent relationship with Oman. Uh, they have relationships with Qatar as well. So I, I think there are many players that can help in this process. Yeah, I, you know, this is this is a tragedy that it's sort of we all know the solution to it, but no one knows how to get. Uh, to the solution, and, it, and I find myself at times very sad with Yemeni friends and so forth. My, uh, well, my you, know, you know, it's the same problem with Yemenis. We say we have a problem of uh, confidence, and, and the same applies to the regional players. They don't have confidence in each other. And this is what complicates things. That's a rather pessimistic uh, uh, view. I, I <clears throat> if. Hypothetically, let me ask a question. We're approaching the end of our time, and I this would be an interesting discussion. Again, going back 
to the Civil War of the 1960s. What would happen, in your view, if the outside powers agreed amongst themselves to simply leave, to stop getting involved, and to leave it entirely up to the Yemenis? Well, Yemen, Yemenis have gone through conflicts before that, and they always resorted to their own uh, uh, tribal and uh, uh, historical means of resolving conflicts. Now the picture is a little more complicated. Are there Yemeni parties uh, that are that prosper from the continuation of the civil war? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? There are parties of Yemeni on the Yemeni uh, position that actually see the civil war the continuation of the civil war to be to their advantage. For example, I was thinking of some of the extremist uh, uh, jihadist groups in the south and elsewhere. Are there parties that would like to see the civil war continue among the Yemenis, and do they have the influence to continue it, to prevent negotiation? Well, well there, are, there will always be those who will uh, benefit from instability, but I, I'm sure that the majority of the Yemenis and political would like to see Yemen stable and united and they sure. will uh, without the influences from uh, outside they will unite their efforts to achieve that objective so these domestic groups that might be happy or with the continuation of the war would not have the influence uh, to be able to stop uh, moves towards peace well they will not stop it but they will uh, they will have to be confronted, of course. No, but they are not strong enough to stop it, in your view. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Al Kirby, this has been a fascinating discussion. I'm so happy that uh, we've had the opportunity. I look forward. Uh, the last time we met, we actually we were able to talk to each other in person. I would be delighted as to when we can do that next. Uh, before we say goodbye to our audience, uh, could you sort of wrap up uh, the situation now and where you think uh, hope lies for a uh, the an end to the civil war? Well, I think uh, we all agree that uh, Yemen is in a catastrophic situation and that the suffering of the Yemeni people cannot be ignored by uh, first of all by the uh, GCC countries and the Arab countries, and then by the international community, and by five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. And that they all have really to find the ways of relieving this Yemen from this situation. This is not a very difficult task if there is unity on, for the, to achieve this objective. This objective can be achieved if the new special envoy to Yemen addresses the issues that we have talked to about. Of course, I mean, these are contributions that are made to him to look at the ideas that we've discussed in this session. And hopefully he will find some of them useful for him to develop a, an action plan that will draw a roadmap for taking Yemen out of the war zone to the peace zone. Oh, thank you again, min famak le as they would, as well, we say. And I hope very much that there are wise people who can who can start this process in place. Uh, Dr. Al Kurbi, it is as always a great pleasure and an honor to have you on our program. And we, I look forward to seeing you hopefully in person in the not too distant future, perhaps when we run out of Greek letters in the COVID. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me and great pleasure having this uh, uh, exchange of ideas with each other and with the audience. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank our audience. I wish I could see you all. We can't, but we look forward to the day when we will be able to be in person. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the, uh, the, the council will be hosting a seminar, one of our series of Angli uh, Arabic language uh, seminars. Uh, 
The topic at noontime tomorrow will be Iraq and how it is playing its role trying to develop a strategic, strategic position between Iran, the United States, and the Gulf Cooperation Council. Thank you all again for being with you today. Godspeed, uh, God bless, and I hope we see you all soon. Thank you again.